Pietro and say, uh, yeah, we, we discussed that we are going to record this meeting. As our president, Isaac President Pietro Alize is also here with us today, uh, actually sacrificing his holiday, as I could understand. So I would just um, like to give him the floor to uh, actually welcome all of us in, in just a couple of words. So Pietro, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see you all here. Yeah, indeed, in Italy today is a very important public holiday, so my family is waiting for me. But I wanted to stay here to welcome you all, because um, as we discussed when we started to organize this event, it is very important for ISOCARP to link again and maybe consistently for the very first time with the Japanese community of planners. So this is very important and I would like to reinforce once again this concept. I don't want to uh, lose you now. I don't want to waste the time of this meeting. I have no other words to uh, add, just to wish you uh, a splendid meeting. I will stay with you some minutes and then I, I, will, uh, I will go with my family. Have a good meeting and I hope this is the very first event of many others that we can make. And I really wish that we can make events in person and not just online. This is we can meet each other in, in reality. Have a good meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Pietro. Thanks a lot, and really appreciating um, this this short intro, having in mind uh, the general situation with the Italian holidays and and holiday, holiday specific today. So uh, yes, also warm welcome on my side from the entire ISOCAR board who actually contributed to organizing this meeting. And just uh, a couple of words on Cyber Agora events. So Cyber Agora is actually intended um, as a knowledge platform platform for knowledge sharing which is actually totally um in 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 line with actually is a mission from uh, knowledge for sharing uh, uh, sharing knowledge for cities and actually the cyber agora is uh, considered as a platform for debating about the hot topics of of our time so uh, this um, specific one is eighth in a row so we discussed very informally briefly that we had uh, organized this on different topics and this one today is particularly related to the hot issue hot topic of our times i would say so this transformation from uh, smart city towards smart society so what does it entail and uh, we are very honored to have uh, diverse speakers uh, with he with us here today so speakers experts in the domain of smart city and smart society coming from um, academia on the one hand but also practitioners on the other side and uh, as already announced um, about the topic of uh, smart city, and um, I will be very, very brief here. So I would just like to um, hear from our experts today, uh, what are the tools, what are the mechanisms, what are the me instruments actually to bring this topic into implementation in order to make cities for all, in order to make cities more people-centered, human-centered, in order to see actually how decisions among different stakeholders are made. And finally, what is behind the concept of smart city? Actually, who is financing this and how does it actually fits into the global narrative of neoliberalism and global financialization? So let's actually critically discuss this topic today. So um, with this in mind, actually, we are going to start now with uh, input from our colleagues, uh, particularly referring to Japan case and smart society fifth generation as a concept which actually is stemming originally from Japan. So I'm also very looking very much forward to, to learn something more about this. And uh, with this in mind, I'm actually inviting uh, professors Shirazaka and Nagumo from the Keio and Kyoto University, respectively. And also in the second part of our presentation, we will see, we'll hear the inputs from Mr. Cepeda, Mrs. Osawa from Oriental Consultants Global and Mr. Chamorro from the Mirai Share. Uh, so uh, the very last um, section of our session today will be devoted of course to the Q&A rounds where all of us will be happy to address any questions, any concerns from the audience that may arise and actually with the aim of understanding what smart society actually is. So in this very moment, I'm actually finishing my short intro and giving the floor to Yurara. Yurara, please, um, would you like to introduce our first two yes. speakers? Floor to yes. Um, hi, my name is Yurara. I participated in uh, Isocarp Doha last year, uh, currently researching at the University of Tokyo. That's just my short intro. Um, we have two guests from uh, Japan, 
from the sort of academic slash more broad uh, general idea side. Um, both of our guests uh, from this half of today's uh, event have extensive experience in the smart city field in Japan, both practice and research. They're also at the forefront of policies related to smart city planning, as well as what are referred to in Japan as smart uh, super city and uh, digital uh, garden city initiatives. And I think that the understanding of uh, smart cities in Japan or in any country requires an understanding of the context and sort of the dynamics of the party is involved in one night. And so I think the two speakers today will be providing insight on that, on the background and the uh, trends of smart city planning and po uh, policies in Japan. Uh, we will first have uh, Mr. Chirasaka, so I will introduce him briefly. Uh, while I'm introducing you, you can prepare your uh, slide. Um, he is the professor of the Graduate School of System Design and Management at the univers um, at Keio University. He has a academic background in space systems engineering, uh, system development methodology, system insurance, and uh, system safety. He has experience in the private sector in many ways, as well as advisory work for cities in Japan that uh, prioritize uh, smart city initiatives and policies. So uh, you can start your presentation and share your slides. Okay, thank you, Wada. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening. My name is Eiko Shirasaka from K University. So today I'd like to talk about the, our Japanese Society 5.0 approach. And very briefly, but the, if we have any question, you can ask me. Okay. So today, as I mentioned, so we Japanese, now we are focusing on Society 5.0. To realize that, or I will explain later what it is, and to realize that it's not only for the uh, technical items, of course. It's more focusing on human center. Maybe, so, and Nagumo san will talk about the livable well being city indicator. It, it is a very, very important topic for us because it, we, we always want to focus on it is not a technology, it is more for human. So, that is a very, very important our message for this 35.0. Okay, so <laughs> I introduce very briefly my background is more okay, technical side. So I I have a several a uh, <laughs> okay so a uh, I I have the experience in the development of space systems uh, when I work working for the Mitsubishi Electric Corporation however once I changed my job to the AKU University not only for the uh, technical item but also the human system combined system technology and human society a combined system is our target to design. And the, uh, we have the similar things in between technical part and society part. Of course, we have the difference also, but we can utilize our approach of the uh, okay, technical things to non-technical item too. So the architecture, idea of the architecture is one of them. So I will explain later about uh, the what is a architecture. Okay, that is a system architecture. Usually architecture, of course, it's a kind of the building and the houses, but the system architecture is not only for that. Okay, according to the a ISO standard, the definition of the architect system architecture is, okay, something like that is written a little bit longer. But the, in briefly, I explain what is a System architecture, architecture itself is okay. When we have the a system, system is usually we have the some kind of object goals. So we want to realize that goal, and to realize that goal, we have the means. Okay, it's sometimes it's a, a technical things like a, a, okay, a hardware or the software, and the, also we can utilize okay papers to as a means. To realize objects. The architecture is in between. Architecture is realize this object to utilizing by utilizing this means. So that means architecture is a mechanism to realize objectives by combining means. This is a architecture, system architecture. Okay. And this is uh, now very in 
getting more and more important because system architecture is not a not a so new concept of course it was a very normal concept however now what is happening in the society is now we have the we call digital era we have the new means it's a digital it's different from previous means now we have the new means that means when we utilize that new means, we can realize new objectives that, that cannot be, could not be realized before. By utilizing new means, we can realize these new things. So these new objectives, this is a human center, well-being, a livable well-being city is a kind of the, one goal. It was not realized by the ordinary means. By utilizing a new means, digital means, we can now realize this human-centered, livable well-being city. What is Japan approach? So we call Society 5.0. Of course, as a beginning, Society 1.0 is hunting. 2.0 is a agriculture. 3.0 industrialized, 4.0 information, and then 5.0, what is this? So it's a starting from human-centered society. The goal is anyway human-centered society, but how is a method is highly integrated cyber space and physical space. It's not so new, but okay. Highly integrated is very important. Of course, during the Society 4.0, we have physical space and cyberspace both. What's the difference between 4.0 and 5.0? In 4.0, we have we need a human in between physical system, physical space, and cyber, cyberspace. Human input the information from the physical space to the cyberspace. In the cyberspace, the information is processed and of course output like a, okay the route to the goal based on that information human people drive a car that means people act to the a physical space based on the cyber space output that means we need a human in between cyber space and the physical space it is a slightly 4.0 in the 5.0 now we don't need a human. Sensor can capture the state of the physical space and that information put to the cyberspace. And the a calculation or the process of the, a, that information, like a route to the goal, it drive a okay, automated driving car to the physical space. That means we don't need human. Robot and automation technology, well, okay. A connect in between the physical space and the cyberspace. And of course, as you know, we have the artificial intelligence, AI, on the cyberspace. Without a human, this closed loop is automatically running always, and cyberspace is automatically updated. It is one thing, it is completely different from 4.0. And also, of course, okay, we have the cyberspace and the physical space combined. And cyberspace is already connected, of course, through the internet. So what happened? One more thing is, OK, like a okay, mobility system connected to the a cyberspace and the, a hospital system, physical space system connected to cyberspace. So what happened connected in between? It, of course, it connected the cyber physical system, but it, cyberspace has already connected through the internet, that means physical space is something, okay, feeling like a collaborate through the a cyberspace. So for example, once we reserve the hospital, the car automotive will come to my home to pick me up to go to the hospital in time in the, uh, my a reservation time. So such kind of things, it's okay. It looks like the cyber 
Okay. Automotive, physical automotive and the physical uh, hospital collaborate together. This kind of the connection of the uh, individual system, it, it is called the system of systems in our field. Okay, this system of system is one of the very important topic in our study 5.0. This is an example of the system of system from the Incose systems engineer handbook. It's very technical things. However, okay, one thing, this is a Canon's EOS camera, this are camera. Of course, this is a system. And the right hand side, we have the Curate Packard uh, printer. It is also a system. How about we connect both of them? We take a picture by cam Canon's camera and connect to the uh, HP printer and print it out. This connected one is also a system, but it is not the same as a okay, traditional system like a Canon's camera and HP printer camera. What is the difference? When we think about it doesn't work well, how we treat that, how we can handle that? That means, okay, if Canon's camera doesn't work well, we can just call the Canon or contact the Canon. If HTB, uh, no, a HP printer doesn't work well, of course we can contact the HP. How about the connected one? If connected one doesn't work well, whom we should to call? We cannot judge immediately. So currently, connected system is not ensured of the uh, quality in total by anyone. Nobody assure the quality of the connected one. So smart steam, smart grid, IoT system, a industry 4.0. Many of them are system of system. No one ensure the quality of that end to end system quality. That is a very new things in the field currently in our society. This is a kind of a, a issue. However, it can create a new value for us. Okay, I will explain that one. In this 34 point there, era, of course, we think about the human-centered approach, of course. Hospital, we have the uh, human-centered approach. Mobility, we have the human-centered approach. And pharmacy, we have the also human-centered approach. But human-centered approach within each system. This is a four point there. But people, as you know, we run through each system. We are not separated to use. We, are, we use them connectedly. That means we reserve the hospital, take a mobility, okay, take a car, car come to my house, okay, car bring me to the hospital. If, okay, something like a traffic jam, may I may delay my reservation time. That information is passed through to the hospital. Hospital automatically change my reservation time to a later one. And a follower will come up. And such kind of thing, so automatically change. And then after my hospital, okay, I took my car, my mobility to the pharmacy. But be, for example, if I go to the supermarket first and then buy something and then go to the pharmacy, I don't need my pills immediately. So that information passes to the pharmacy. Pharmacy prepare my things just in time when I arrive there. So later guy can take earlier than me. So such kind of connected, my, my journey is connected. So to realize my human-centered approach means each person work differently. Each person have the different journey. So for that purpose, each separated system are connected for each person and realize the body for each guy. This is a kind of human-centered approach. But for that purpose, the important key is interoperability of the system. Interoperability is very much important for the key for the 35.0. To realize interoperability of the smart city, like a, a, like a smart city, Japanese government developed a smart city reference architecture based on the society 5.0 reference architecture. Reference architecture is 
for interoperability. Okay, I will explain a little bit and I will finish. Okay, so left hand side here, this is a certifying point, zero reference architecture. This is just listed up what kind of the item is important for the interoperability. Of course, a hardware and the data format and the communication protocol, such kind of things, they are easy to think about that. But not only for that, for the organization, rules, policy, strategy is important for the interoperability too. For example, it's very easy one is a security. Even for we have the same okay, format data, same protocol of the communication, but if we have the different uh, security level, we cannot exchange data itself. So that means not only such kind of hardware software things, but also our society things like a policy, rules, organization is also important for the interoperability. Based on the, this society 5.0 reference architecture, a government, a, a cabinet officer Japan developed a smart city reference architecture. It's basically the same items. But it is just listed up. It is not, okay, what, what kind of the viewpoint we have to think about for the interoperability. Also, a cabinet officer Japan developed the a overview of the each item relationships. This is a list, not only just for the list of the interoperability, but how related to each other. The interesting point is a right hand side here, it is city OS, that means it's a technical part. Not only for technical part, but also the left hand side, city management is more human side. So human side and the technical side, we need both. So human side support a user like a residence, and also management side, people side, human side also support a residence. Both from the both side to support a users to realize a human centered using a human centered approach and a livable well being city to realize that. This is our approach for that. Okay, let me summarize what I talk about today. For the system architecture, we have the new objectives. That is a livable well being city related to smart city or related to smart uh, society. And we have the new technology like a, a cyber physical system and also a system of system to connecting in both to realize this objective, livable well-being city through the human-centered approach by utilizing new digital technology. This is a society 5.0 architecture. And we are utilizing the reference architecture which developed a government, uh, Japan, cabinet office of Japan developed. So based on that, so each, okay, a government and also a industry can focusing on which item we think about for the interoperability when develop our system itself. This is our approach. Okay, thank you very much for your listening. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Um, I will next present our, uh, introduce our next presenter. And just to uh, add for everyone uh, participating in the event, if you have a question, you can add in the chat during the presentations and we can check during the Q&A. So feel free to comment there. Um, questions, comments, anything is fine. Um, next, we have Mr. Nagumo. He's an assistant perspe uh, professor at uh, Kyoto University's Graduate School of Management and served as a uh, executive officer at the Mitsubishi FJ uh, Financial uh, Group and MHG Bank. He's currently a senior management executive officer at the Mitsubishi FJ Research and Consulting um, and belongs to the Smart City Initiative uh, organization as uh, Mr. Shirasaka. And he also has experiences in strategic management, both in Japan and uh, globally, I think in the United States. Um, so that's the introduction for Mr. Nagumo. Uh, you can take this slide. Okay, thank you very much for a kind introduction, Urara-san. So let me share with you the slide first and talk about the uh, something we have just developed most recently in Japan, which is the uh, uh, livable well-being well, well city indicator. 
it's just on the way. And uh, just about myself, it's been already introduced just quick. So I have uh, multiple um, positions at the uh, uh, public and private and academia. And uh, also I extend my uh, uh, activities in Europe as well. Uh, visiting professor, professor at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia, for example, right? And uh, uh, just to talk about what's uh, underway at the uh, ground level uh, in Japan, is that uh, execution of the Digital Guardian City Nation Initiative under uh, Kishida administration today, and I'm deeply involved in the activities. And uh, this schematic is a kind of iconic view uh, to talk about the uh, Digital Guardian City Initiative in Japan. And uh, excuse me for some Japanese languages indicated, but schematics may explain what it is. You can see kind of watermelon cut into half, uh, placed on the two uh, round tray. And the trays are uh, the digital infrastructure, just like uh, Stress Kassen said talked about, the uh, city OS, so to speak. And the at the edge of the watermelon, you can see the numbers 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 that represent the age of the people, the, the life events of the people. So what we are trying to do is to set the uh, solutions from public and private sectors to meet the needs of people at the uh, life events. And what's new in this initiative is uh, circled around in red, the well-being. We didn't have that vision recent, uh, until most recently. We were kind of uh, dedicated to the uh, futuristic uh, technology dream, so to speak, and never to talk about you know, what the outcome would look like from the human standpoint. But under the current initiatives, uh, we have decided to measure how people feel well-being and livability as a result of implementing smart cities or digital transformation. Probably you are familiar with this kind of schematics. Uh, in the second and the third layer in the middle, you can see the hardware, uh, the, the physical infrastructure to which you put the uh, sensors, the IoT device and so forth to collect the data and create these solutions at the digital layer. But you never talked about human and society layer before. So that's a new layer we added under this current uh, administration. Not to mention the last layer, natural layer, is the most important, so to speak. But the, my focus of this uh, presentation is the human society layer. And uh, this is a kind of the first vision we created as a, a proposal for its, uh, Kamakura City's uh, super city proposal to uh, uh, national government. You can see. On top, you can see a well-being notation. There's a picture of the people uh, laughing, smiling, right? So without that, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to us today. So how can you incorporate the co-creation of the well-being uh, with people or residents and government, and local governments, and the corporations and local profit organization, academia, so to speak, PPPP, you can say, uh, in local government, local areas is a kind of key framework we are now implementing. And uh, this is a kind of a, a schematics that, that talks about how we crafted idea into one package. You can see on the left hand side, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, which is a kind of a psychological you know, mantra, so to speak. Uh, you can see uh, in a triangle, uh, safety needs and phys uh, physical needs at the end. This is a must have kind of a, a needs, medical, shelter, food, and so forth, right? And uh, two layers in the middle, esteem and belonging and love, is uh, where you belong to. You're not alone. You have friends, you have neighbors, you have family, you have uh, uh, recognition as a member of the society, right? On top, you have the uh, self actualization and the most important is self transcendence. This is about the generosity to different people. How can you implement this kind of uh, idea into the cities? Through the implementation of the smart city is a key question we are faced with today. We are almost done with the uh, last two, two layers, physical health uh, and uh, societal health, so to speak. Maybe uh, for the societal, social health is halfway through, but the mental health is uh, something we are keen at. 
Uh, as you can see from the United Nations uh, World Happiness Report, Japan is placed as number 54 because of the weaknesses in generosity and the freedom to make uh, choices, right? So even if you implement autonomous driving cars, online, blah, 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 you don't really make people happier unless you hit the button on generosity and the freedom to make choices. So that's the kind of you know, recognition we have today. And on the right hand side, you can see SDGs, which I'm sure everyone's working hard for the past years. And this is approach to uh, improve the quality of life from the outside in. This is a kind of a you know, good comparison from the Maslow's point of view. It's inside out, starting from inside of human, inside of brain, inside of heart. And uh, SDGs is taking action from outside in. So we'd like to combine two way approach into one. You can see this onion like uh, you know, schematics surrounded by the rainbow. This is you know, uh, schematics of how people live in the city, right? And uh, we'd like to measure inside out, outside in. And we actually created a measurement system. And it's been underway under uh, Garden City initiatives. And the 27 cities are selected as uh, pioneer cities to implement this idea and the measurement system just I'm just talking about. And this is a three-layered approach. Uh, at the bottom of this uh, schema, you can see livability. This is a measurement of social uh, uh, health, um, social, social determinants of health, meaning using the uh, open data, you measure 22 aspects of daily life. So objective assessment of where you live. And on top, you can see green uh, one and the orange one. This is a subject well-being. The reason why you have two boxes is that on the left-hand side, the well-being of local life, is this is the well-being of individual. You as an individual. You're not talking about anyone else, but you yourself. An orange one is about community, so-called interdependent well-being. This is a, you know, kind of a specific to Japanese culture. Uh, if you are happy alone, you, you yourself become so scared because something bad will happen to you. Maybe you're too happy. But you know, people surrounding are uh, also happy as you are. You are more kind of comfortable because everyone is as happy as you are. So we are trying to measure happiness of your family, your community, people surrounding you. Something sitting in the middle, a factor of activities is an interesting one. You know, in my case, I'm trying to do a diet. I wholeheartedly decided to do a diet. But after drinking with my friends, I conclude with sushi, Chinese noodle, whatever the carbons. So, you know, there's a discrepancy in what I think and what I do. So we decided to measure the activities as well. And the blue one, Active QL, is a modern one. You use a smartwatch to measure the vitals. So you see, if you are in a very uh, place you like, maybe museum in front of a uh, you know, famous painting, your heart beating faster. So the uh, smartwatch catches you that you are very happy when you're. So this is a more you know digital de device based measurement systems, and it gives you the real time, more time specific and the place specific situation of where are people are feeling happy. And uh, the yellow one, Central City, is another survey-based approach, but it counts how many times you did it. If you like night view of the city, uh, maybe Sydney or maybe uh, Vienna, you know, how many times have you been there this month? You count it. You like a specific, specific food in a, a local uh, community, this uh, survey asks you, how many times have you eaten that food? So this evidences you that you know, action is accompanying this video emotion. And we are trying to do sophisticated analysis of this, these three layers consist of five boxes and find out what the city's uh, well-being would look like. I'm sure all the cities have very different uh, specific specificity of the well-beings. So before implementing technologies, let's see where you have a critical components in your mindset. What's the algorithm of well-being in the city? 
once you know that, you know where you would like to implement the digital technologies. Without that, you are throwing money, tax money into the, the vacuum. So we uh, decided to measure first. Without measurement, you cannot manage it. And uh, this is two uh, details, so I don't want to deep dive into this, but you know, just represent how it would look like. You can see 10 categories consist of a total of 30 questions for this is uh, well-being of local life uh, index. This is created by the professor uh, Maeno, Maeda, uh, Maeno of Keio University, actually a colleague of uh, Shirasaki Sensei. And the uh, orange one, independent well-being. This is a survey system created by the professor uh, Uchida of the Kyoto University, uh, where I belong to. And then this is becoming a little famous nowadays because it's a quite new from Asian angle, a little bit different from the Western angle. It counts, you know, more community-based interdependent well-being. And the ActiveQL, this is the uh, uh, device-based uh, measurement system. And it's uh, activity-specific. You can see work, educational, hospital visit, child care activity-specific, and the measure your heartbeats. And the uh, central city is a uh, survey based and counts the frequency of your activity. And uh, by the way, this is kind of you know interesting one. It counts the number of romance you experienced in the city as well. And anonymity is sometimes important as of you know attractiveness of the city. So this is included as an ingredient. And uh, this is the objective open database livability, the traditional one. It captures 22 aspects of uh, our daily life. And uh, we divided it into physical well-being, social well-being, and mental well-being. And uh, new feature is this mental. Um, how uh, do we have an you know, opportunity to up the upscale uh, your skill sets, update your skill, uh, skill sets? Uh, do we have uh, you know, uh, freedom to learn what you want to? And uh, business creation like uh, startups? Do you have enough challenges in your community? The culture and art, do you have a you know opportunity to express yourself? Diversity, you have a chance to meet some someone very attractive to you? These are the questions newly added. And we created a dashboard like this. That's it's down, downloadable for anyone in Japan. We created the dashboard for all municipalities across Japan. 1700 uh municipalities uh dashboards are all available free of charge so it's a public goods so both subjective well-being and objective well-being data can be downloaded to design the human center smart city for any and this is just you know, showcasing how these uh, you know uh, schematics are uh, looks like you know kamakura city tsukuba city they, they, they're all different the green one represents the uh, objective, the, the orange line represents subjective score. So you can see the gap between subjective and uh, objectives. Sometimes it doesn't meet. You know, in the one city, there are a lot of traffic accidents, but people, people don't report, you know, how often they get it. They, they don't sense it because it's happening so often in your life. But, you know, from the uh, municipality government point of view, it's important to reduce the number of the traffic accidents, right? So something happening to you often usually uh, uh, go hand in hand between subject and objective indicators. But you know something like a car accident, it happens may maybe once in your life. It doesn't really capture a subject well-being, but you know counted in the objective uh, well-being. And the detail, the KPI levels can be uh, visualized like this and downloadable. This is uh, physical health, uh, social health, and the mental health. And uh, you can do a lot of things. You know, this is a uh, you know, correlation between livability and uh, well-being. The x-axis is the objective, y-axis is subjective. You can see you know, how they are relating to each other. And uh, you can create uh, scenarios or narratives based upon the uh, data. This is a case of Kamakura City, which is the number one city for coexistence of nature. And uh, putting the Maslow's hierarchy as a post guide, you can see in the yellow one representing physical health, 
since it's a very much uh, surrounded by the nature, people come there. People are attracted by the nature. Now, once people come here, people get the joy of being surrounded by nature and actually get the healthier. That promotes the people's sentiment towards protecting nature. That drives the people to participation in civic activities or political activities to protect the nature. Once the political output is successful, it turns out to be uh, civic pride in the city. And that can be seen as uh, local brands from the outside, can be seen as a sense of community from inside. So creating this kind of narratives based upon the uh, data-driven analysis is a key to make city uh, human-centered. And we are not going to be making ranking of the cities based on the numbers, but we are, we are you know, uh, pushing the cities to see what the key point of attractiveness, where you have a chances to make city more attractive through the digital transformation based upon the analysis from data. You, you can see the uh, output of the uh, analysis to policies and decide who to work with, government, uh, private sector, and the civic sectors, and so forth. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. We will now go into the partitioners. So I will hand it off to, I think, Henry. Mm -hmm. Thank you too for your presentations. Yeah, thanks also on my side. It was extremely interesting to uh, see all these intangible aspects introduced into the topic of uh, smart society. So this is actually what counts and what makes this shift. Yeah, and this very moment we are proceeding further with this um, second part of our presentation where we first host Mr. Cepeda and Mrs. Osava. So Mr. Cepeda is an urban and transport planner with more than 18 years of project experience. His recent work includes advising transit-oriented development viability along a BRT corridor in Medan, Indonesia, as well as coordinating capacity building for a newly formed sustainable urban transport authority in Vietnam, Laos. For a smart city development proposal in Vietnam, Mr. Cepeda proposed transport and urban design elements to meet sustainable KPIs related to sustainable development goals, and I think we are going to hear something about this today. Uh, also brief intro on uh, Mrs. Osava. Mrs. Osava has more than 14 years of hybrid career as an urban and real estate developer, as well as a city planner. She has multidisciplinary expertise in a commercial planning and development field with project experience spanning widely from a sophisticated mixed use development situated in central Tokyo to a sustainable and emerging new city plans in Yangon, Myanmar. Her recent work also includes a wide array of smart city planning and development, which ranges from strategy and policy development to master planning and mobility planning. So I very warmly welcome both of you. Please, floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, everyone can see the screen okay? Yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. Konnichiwa. Hola. Salve. Bonjour. Guten tag. Ni hao. Assalamu alaikum. I, I hope I covered everyone. Uh, so, um, impressive, Connery, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So, what uh, what I, along with Ms. Osawa, will will share is a kind of a case study of how a, a civil engineering company is reacting to this shift into society 5.0 that we've heard from from the two professors. Um, so we represent Oriental Consultants Global, uh, shortened to OC Global. It's, again, civil engineering company with over 60 years of experience, and uh, but working in international development. So we're based in Tokyo, Japan, but our projects are international. We have over 4,000 projects in uh, 150 countries uh, with various offices and subsidiaries worldwide. And so this is more of how we take the Japanese know-how and expertise and export it uh, to other areas of the world, and in this case being Southeast Asia. And we'll even have a case study by Ms. Osawa um, in, in specific to uh, how the Japanese do smart city TOD or transit-oriented development. And so, just, again, just how being a civil engineering company, we're a consulting firm. Of course, we have, you know, we're in the private sector and we have clients that we have to respond to. But how can us as a consultancy contribute to the different 
revolutions that are ongoing. So we we know Japan is is the as at the forefront of society 5.0. You've also you're also familiar with uh, uh, the industrial Re Re revolution, and some say that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, some also say that we're in the third mobility revolution, as well as the fourth service revolution. And mobility and service are next to each other uh, on purpose because mobility as a service is something that is ongoing. And actually, our next speaker, uh, Azarel, Azarel uh, Chamorro, uh, is is one of the premier experts when it comes to mobility as a service. But just want to give uh, some context into the different revolutions that are ongoing. And so how can we as a consulting firm uh, react uh, with this ongoing shift? And so as a company, our particular strengths are in uh, JICA funded projects, uh, JICA being uh, the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, so the, the ODA, Japan giving uh, grants and loans to different countries. Uh, and then as, a, as consultants, mostly we work in the road and railway sectors uh, in Asia, of course, being headquartered in Japan. Uh, but thanks to, in response to this shift, uh, in part due to Society 5.0, we created a separate division of which Ms. Osawa and I are a part of that are seeking to diversify. So not being so focused just on JICA, but also the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, other multilateral development banks, as well as directly with public governments and the private sector. And, and we've identified four pillars that we want to focus on. And actually the first two I will touch on. So of course, smart city. Uh, which is what we're talking about now, and then capacity development. I'll explain the relevance of that uh, in a little bit. And then we're also looking into uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which we've talked about. And we, of course, want to expand uh, into other regions. And so we've responded in the following way. Um, we, we've acknowledged that, uh, so city planning is already quite comprehensive. We had land use design, environment, economic development, mobility, uh, but how do we make it smart? Uh, and so we've as, as we've collectively defined it as uh, strategic smart city planning is one that accounts for hardware, software, and humanware. Humanware is, is, is one that, that we've, we've already listened to in, in the previous presentations. You know, we often forget about the human element of, of why we do all this. Hardware is pretty self-explanatory. That's that's the tangible infrastructure. Uh, of course, being civil engineers, we that's that's kind of the bread and butter of what we do. But then we start looking more into the software and uh, whether it's a management system or an operating system and OS, uh, using that terminology. But also the humanware. How can we best train uh, train the train the government and train the private sector to how do how do they can best best use these new technologies available? Um, you know, it's one thing to just you know the technology it, it it serves a community, but also you need people behind the scenes to manage and maintain it. So how can we develop that capacity? So just some quick examples. Uh, so hardware, of course, uh, you know we I can go on and on about road and railway uh, projects, uh, but. This particular one is, is has a, a little bit of a smart city lens to it. Uh, this was for Manila and the Philippines. Uh, Jitney is a is a pretty well known public transport method uh, for decades in the Manila region. So it's American made jeeps that have been converted to basically serve as public transport. Well, how can uh, we use Japanese technology to make it uh, make it more sustainable uh, for the environment? Uh, low carbon or even zero carbon. So introducing battery swapping technology uh, for these jitneys that already serve uh, the community. So this is an example of the hardware part of it. Uh, an example of the software, and I'm treating a little bit because this is not Southeast Asia. This project is, is in the United States, but our company has been involved with uh, developing uh, not only the the, the hardware of the, the road, the sensor that would be installed in your everyday passenger vehicle that would collect uh, real-time data on the pavement condition. Uh, so we've been working uh, with SoftBank and with, uh, with Pacific Consultants 
on the hardware, but also the software. So you have to collect the data, but what do you do with the data? Uh, what data is important to the various departments of transportation that manage uh, these roadways uh, in the United States? And so we've uh, done some pilot uh, implementations, including in California and in, in Ohio, Ohio in particular, because there's a, a large uh, Honda manufacturing plant there. So uh, they already have a good relationship. So we've been uh, interviewing and, and speaking with the public sector, both cities at the city level and at the state level, to see what uh, what data is most important to them when it comes to pavement condition, uh, so that then they can go out and react uh, to poor pavement condition in real time. So that's an example of the software side of things. And then going back to Southeast Asia, the human wear. So this is the capacity development. Uh, we have been training uh, for the past uh, three years. This has been ongoing still, and we have some more workshops coming up next month in Vientiane, Laos. Uh, they created a new agency that is devoted to sustainable urban transport. And we have been tasked, this is an uh, Asian development funded project. We have been tasked with uh, providing training of best practices. Uh, this is how other cities are reacting. Uh, this is how other cities are managing, um, you know, these various uh, revolutions in mobility and in society. So uh, this is the human wear component of it, of how we've been, we've been uh, developing the capacity uh, on the government side. And I've been uh, myself have been involved in this project. So now I'll turn it over to Ms. Osawa, who will present us with a case study. Uh, thank you so much, Connie, for your introduction. And nice to meet you again. My name is Shiki Osawa. Uh, I will take uh, only five to six or seven minutes to introduce one of the case studies that we are practicing in the real world. Uh, Today, I would like to bring the example of TOD for this uh, because um, there are some reasons for my bringing this example. Uh, maybe one reason is because uh, the issues and problem and project that we are facing uh, on a daily basis is always about physical, physical city. So I wanted to, to talk more about the physical uh, city planning rather than uh, of course, we have some projects uh, for so-called smart city, like concept making a smart city planning itself. But today, I'd like to focus more on the COD. And what I believe from this smart city context is, of course, smart city is sometimes considered as an end state of how it works, how it functions uh, by utilizing the big data and like digital IoT and others. But sometimes I would believe that as a planner, uh, we have a lot that we can uh, in the process of planning the cities. Uh, in other words, we have we have so many things that we can do in a smart way to plan the city. And TOD, they let uh, me skip the explanation of what TOD is because I believe most of participants today uh, have planning background. Uh, but one thing clear is that Japan is well known for the TOD and we have so many successful TOD projects in Japan and we as a Japan-based international consulting firm uh, we are very actively promoting and practicing uh, TOD planning uh, outside Japan especially in Asia. Uh, next slide please. Thank you so much. And as you know, every city has issues and there is no exception for Southeast Asian cities uh, because of uh, healthy economic growth, urban population growth. There are also so many uh, ongoing issues such as traffic congestion, air pollution, and so on. And in order to solve these issues, uh, what we are contributing is this. Thanks, and one more. <laughs> thank you so much. We are mainly contributing from the viewpoint of uh, transportation, especially public transportation, and also transit-oriented development, AC1. Next slide, please. Yeah. And we, OCG, have a strong presence in TOD planning field, and there is a reason for that, uh, because uh, our railway uh, team 
railway team division has a strong presence in railway engineering all over the world, especially in Asia. So that makes us uh, easier to collaborate each other and synergize each other over professional contribution of infrastructure, engineering, transportation, and city planning. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, one of the cases, Jakarta, uh, as is uh, known by everyone, uh, Jakarta is one of the biggest cities in the world uh, with over 1 million, uh, 10 million population. And in contrast with uh, these opportunities of, uh, and also economic dy dynamics, there are so many urban issues especially uh, among transportation, congestion, urbanization and things. And we have several projects ongoing in Jakarta, but one of uh, the latest one is MRT phase three uh, project or, or so-called East-West line. Uh, this project has been in the basic design phase and planned to run over 80 kilometers. It's 80 kilometers long across the three provinces, including Jakarta. And there are uh, over 40 uh, plant stations along this line. Uh, next slide, please. And even though this is still in the engineering phase, uh, we planning team were also contributed to some portion in the very beginning of this engineering stage. Uh, there were mainly two portions for it. Uh, one is about TOD. Uh, we, uh, we recommended some of the TOD areas out of uh, 40 stations. And also demand forecast modeling. Our transportation planning team contributes to uh, run the model to estimate the passenger forecast in the future. And in between, I, I mean, in the beginning of this study, we decided to utilize the big data uh, by, by purchasing satellite data. And this uh, broke us abundant uh, benefits, uh, many two benefits. One was time efficiency and another one was uh, quantitative analysis. Because our study period was limited to several months only, but uh, the study scope uh, was a huge area like uh, this railway is planned over 80 kilometers long. So the utilization of big data made us to analyze uh, the entire uh, conditions of existing conditions uh, within a month, actually. And also quantitative analysis, uh, because our model requires quantitative data for them to measure an impact of TOD implementation. So we were requested to provide quantitative data uh, as a study result of our TOD planning. And big data analysis uh, contributed a lot in this sense too. Next. Please. And brief conclusion for, from this slide. Uh, in planning and practicing the smart city, we think that these three elements are very important. One is issue solving, big data driven, and partitionary planning. And uh, I'd like to emphasize uh, at the end of this presentation that uh, by applying uh, smartness, like smart approach, uh, smart planning way, to the process of our planning, uh, I think it will indirectly, even if it is that indirectly, it will contribute to or lead to the smarter society in an effective, efficient, and smarter way. So I believe in this sense, uh, we have a lot that we can contribute for the city to become more smart. Thank you so much, Connie. I will return the mic to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Conry. Thank you very much, Shiki. It was great to oh, see. Oh, I think uh, I have a, uh, just you a are, couple, you couple are, more. You are now continuing. Sorry. Yes, so, yes. No. Sorry, another example. No, no. worries. Uh, well, but in the interest of time, um, what I, I'll just quickly. So this is a good plug for the Isocarp uh, YouTube channel. Um, so we talked about. Um, hardware, software, and humanware, and how do we best integrate it? And uh, Ms. Osawa uh, gave us a case study of Jakarta, but we also have another example of how these were all integrated, uh, this one being in Hanoi, Vietnam, uh, which a, dev a private developer 
uh, wants to introduce a smart city. And so they asked us to do the mobility strategy and how do we bring all these technologies together? How can the synergies of the technologies uh, work together to achieve zero emission mobility? Uh, this was the winner of the uh, award of merit uh, at the last planning Congress uh, last November, which is what my virtual background is, which was held in, in Doha, Qatar. Uh, and then next slide. So, okay, this this is the last one. Um, as a as a another conclusion, I want to just uh, bring to mind a different PPP. So PPP in a planning realm often refers to public private partnerships, um, but this is a new a different PPP in terms of uh, us creating a smart society. Um, partnerships is still one of the P's, but we want to, you know, we think it's important in as we develop these projects to explicitly establish uh, what principles to follow and uh, and to measure them uh, as well. So you can use the sustainable development goals as a good starting point, but basically establish and agree to the principles that will be followed moving forward. And then uh, prioritization. So establishing the what priorities for not not the, the client but also for the society that will be served uh and so this is a, a back and forth collaborative effort uh to develop uh projects that adhere to the, the set priorities and then it's going to require partnerships the public the private sector academia as well as the actual communities that that will be served uh and with that okay that is the the last slide on on our part. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Connery. Thanks a lot, Shiki. Yeah, we enjoyed in uh, elaborating a bit more these principles. And I'm 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 happy to see that actually the principles mentioned developed by your our previous colleagues uh, coming from academia are actually very well recognized also in, in your part and you're actually implementing this in practice. Yeah. So with this I would like to invite our next and last speaker, Azar Chamuro. So Azra, you may prepare your screen while I'm actually introducing you to a broader audience. So uh, Mr. Chamorro is the smart uh, mobility lead at Mirai Share and transport consultant based in Japan with passion for mobility as a service, public transport and new mobility technologies. Uh, Mr. Chamorro has also worked in Spain, France, the UK and China, providing him with, with an international perspective on how different approaches can deal with the same transport and sustainability challenges everywhere. Prior to Mirajsha, he worked at GIS, fostering multi multilateral collaboration between Germany, the EU, and China on sustainable mobility. So this presentation today will be devoted actually to a very specific case study of Membashi Super City. So Azar, the floor is yours, please. Hello. Well, I assume the slides can be seen. Yes. I hope so. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to the rest of the speakers for the presentations. Um, I would like to continue the conversation uh, on the topic of the smart cities, but I want to go back to Japan. So we go back from Hanoi and all these amazing places. I wish I can travel one day. And I would like to focus on the super city concept, which is the smart city, but we're going to look beyond technology. So I'm not going to focus about the technological part, but about the human part and the structure, the framework. Before that, I would like to introduce myself very quickly. So as introduced, I, before I work in different countries, particularly on international uh, development, as well as transportation, because I love transportation. This is the reason why I eventually ended in Japan. Um, that experience is now we need to scale up into the smart city concept. And I would like to focus on that perspective. And I also have credited the longest heavy mobility, which I hope I can still carry on that. Um, now, the super city concept is the smart city concept developed by Japan, as previously uh, introduced by professors. And the difference here is that the smart city concept is focused more into at the local level. The super city concept starts to implement different regional uh, capabilities. And more importantly, it focuses more on the uh, environmental part, so on the creating an environment where all the different features of the super of the smart city can be all connected together. That's what they call in Japan, in Japan the city OS, the city operating system. Now, there, since a few years ago, the Japanese government has uh, provided generous funding into developing those kind of uh, systems, smart city, as well as mobility, particularly. 
And just last last month, uh, 2022, uh, Smart City Hour was released with more than 50 projects, I believe, all over the country. So there is clearly a trend where the Japanese government is very interesting to develop in these systems. Now, the concept of super city was actually tried in several places, and many cities all over Japan, they apply for being a war national super city area. Uh, only two were awarded, but the rest of the city will actually continue their proposals. Some of them will scale them. And one of these city is the city of Maebashi, which I would like to introduce and is the one we have been working at. So what is Maebashi? Where is Maebashi? So you may not know, but Maebashi city is actually a regional capital. It's the capital of the prefecture of Guma, which is very close to Tokyo. It's not a very large town. It's only 300,000 people living there. but it's actually the cheapest city, to, the cheapest largest cities in Japan. One of the issues there is because it's kind of like a rural area, it has the second largest motorization rate, and we're gonna go through that later. And very importantly, to understand why Maebashi has been able to implement a super city, we need to know something very funny, and is that Maebashi is next to Takasaki. And these two cities, they hate each other. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that Maebashi was the economic center of the area for centuries. And in the 70s, 80s, there was a Shinkansen high-speed rail built into Takasaki next to it instead of Maebashi. And because of that, the economic pull safe to the Takasaki city. That's something that Maebashi hasn't really go through. So there is this like fight that, for example, the large, the tallest city, the tallest building in the area is actually Maebashi, not in Takasaki. But this is important because politically speaking, the city of Maebashi has always been one step ahead because they wanted to implement something new. They wanted to be something different. And Takasaki hasn't implemented super city while Maebashi has them. So in this talk, I just want to go through the guidelines of the white paper released by the Japanese government and follow five basic steps to define the, clay, the framework and the activities we have done in Maebashi. And I would like to follow them in order to see how can we structure this. This is just one simple example, but of course, in different regions, there, there need to be different approaches. First of all, what is the issue in Maebashi? That's the important thing. What is the goal? Why do we need to do this? And in Maebashi, the issue is very common to all the cities in Japan, as well as the developed world. Population is decreasing, and that means that taxpayers are decreasing. Less money, less funding, but also more needs. Uh, elderly share is growing up that also in increases that the proficiency of public transport, which also means that more cars might be on the roads, but also means that elderly may not be able to drive. So we are creating an issue here. More cars on the road means that they can have more accidents. So the ball is getting larger and larger. But more importantly, the city of Maebasi has a very big issue now, and it's the transport budget. So they came up with that at the moment, there is about like 700 million yen destined to transport. And the city cannot increase this budget because, well, population is going down. So they need to find ways to make better uses for this budget and but make more efficient transportation. So instead of talking about transportation, which is something they did, they focus on creating an environment. So why don't we just do this for transportation? Why don't we just focus on creating an environment, a different uh, platform, and where transport is a single part of that, that can actually be complementing other things, other pieces of the of the puzzle, say health, education. So they came with that, and that's what they call the Mibuku ecosystem. So this is the visualized perspective. So how can you actually reach that? And the Mibuku ecosystem is not a app, it's not a digital platform itself, it's rather an environment where different platforms can actually find themselves and can actually connect each other to create synergies, for example, in increasing like health, uh, healthcare accessibility with transport accessibility or education, as well as promoting the, the city uh, tourism and so on, for example. So this is a very important difference and it's coming from a broad framework, but this is still flexible enough, as you can see, it's different, it's made of different pieces and that enables the uh, evolution of the system. Now, let's focus for now, let's take a, a broad look. And the thing is that the city was thinking about like, not to just go digital, but first they found that the physical layer, the, the layer where we live is the most important part, right? And the digital layer is a support of that layer. So they came first with the idea that if the city is gonna lose population, 
who may want to organize our future urban planning to be more rational or to be more easy to manage. So they came with the idea that making the city a compact city. So for example, if there are different economic poles through the city as they are, what if instead of having urban sprawl over the place as we have now, well, we, we try to focus uh, on concentrating population about these places. So we can actually connect them with high density transportation and we can actually use on-demand services for those urban sprawls around. And this is what they did. They found, they basically set different areas where they could focus the future of urban planning, where they could use different urban design tools as they did, and then connect them with uh, public transport better, and then use low density transport on demand mobility for other services. And something very curious is that in the city at the moment, there are several bus companies operating and they were able with this planning to put them together, sit them down on the same table so they can actually have a, a better distribution of their, of their, of their public transport network. So again, this is very important. We come up with the real layer. We come up with the goals. We don't come from the digital one. And this is the one, the one I'm going now. So then when we have that goal and when we have the setup, we focus on what kind of digital solutions can actually bring value to that. And I'm just gonna bring one example. There are many, but I want to bring the one we have worked more mostly and is to ensure probability into different, into different services. So. Instead of like going to a new app, a new platform, they were thinking about, okay, is there anything we can already use that everyone has? And in Japan, everyone has the My Number card, which is the, it's kind of like an identity card used for taxation purposes. So they came with the idea that if everyone has this card, maybe we can make use of these assistant services instead of developing an app or a platform that people need to download on purpose. Now, this My Number card is not, very flexible system. So they thought about if we can link that card to a already system payment system, for example, or a digital system, then we can actually make use of that. And that's where the Suica card comes in. The Suica card is basically a payment card that is used for transport and it's operated by JREs, the largest railway company here in Japan. And the idea was to connect both so they can actually create a range of services beyond that. For example, with your My Number car uh, in, in Maebashi, if there's a natural disaster and you need to go to a shelter, for example, you can kind of check in. So if your family don't know where you are, which is very common, for example, with all people, they can actually access to know that you are actually safe in a, in a shelter, for example. You can use that car as well, for example, to book public services such as uh, generations or making your e-tax as you can do it right now. But immobility is actually very interesting. They implement a new service, which I will shortly describe uh, on demand transport. And if you use your My Number car and you are a resident, you get a discount of about 40, 50%. Uh, if you are a person with a specific needs or an elderly. And this is important because it makes able to gather that data. And you can, for example, link healthcare or mobility data into that. You can come up with new revenue models. You can also come with new transport solutions that can support that uh, the sustainable finance the financial sustainability of, of the different transport methods in the city. Now into that, and this is something we develop here. Uh, importantly, when you develop this smart city, you need to find that whatever you do, you need to scale up. So it's good to have a trial, which is very common in Japan, but you eventually you need to go up. And in my city, they came with the idea of my mass, which is a mass app, app. this is an app. And within this app, they integrate different public transport services as well as the on-demand bus that they implement with us. Uh, importantly, this was kind of like a good system with it because eventually, I mean, it has been already in place since 2020, uh, last year, October, and it's still already under, under operation. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the data at the moment since March, but the, in the trial we ran for six months, we noticed that about a third of the people use their Suica as payment for paying the taxi, the not the taxi, sorry, the on-demand bus, and about 16% use my number car, which basically means that about 40% of the residents did use the my, the my number car, which is a very good number. More importantly, in this trial allowed us to find the age and the different profile of the different people, where they went, why, why they went, and this kind of information can actually be used for scaling up the system. How do you scale up the system? 
increasing the different services, increasing the different solutions, and obviously connecting to each other. So for example, into the pipeline, uh, in the future, we are going to see how retail can be integrated into this platform. For example, if you buy something as in, in a shop, and that shop, for example, belongs to a railway company because in the station, that might be used to understand better the consumer patterns. Or if you go to a hospital, and you before that you take a, a bus, you may we may understand how kind of like new what kind of like new transport solutions could be used. But again, coming back to what I say, we come up from the physical layer and the community layer, and from that we find what digital solutions can actually provide a value for the people there. We don't do the way around. And at the moment, there are different solutions. For example, it is possible to see the crowdness of an area based on mobile phone data that's already implemented. Or we are now working towards uh, mobility hubs, which are slightly different from the ones in Europe, but they enable different people to reach out different uh, transport modes. And finally, and very important, formulate regional organization. This couldn't have been possible without bringing, out, bringing out all the partners and all the available stakeholders in the city and the region. And this is very important because the most difficult part is basically put them all together. This is something that the Mahabashi city took the leadership and it was consulted by the minist different ministries, <coughs> bringing in uh, different MPOs, academia, as well as uh, private companies, mobility providers, IT platform, as, as Mila share. And it was a long way of consensus in order to find which kind of solutions actually achieve the goal of what the city wanted to achieve. But not only that, this is the high level one, but what about the low level? What about the people? So there was a very large uh, action towards uh, asking the uh, community about what they thought or about what kind of solutions are will be more interesting for them. So this is very important. Reaching out is very important. And it also brings the community in their opinion, and it makes, obviously, the mo a most successful environment. And finally, a small trivia, something that the city did is that they run a Facebook context where in this contest, the, everyone in the city could submit their su favorite cycle, cycling routes. And along the routes, they could, for example, say what to see, where to eat, and so on. The winners were actually implemented into some sort of like cycling routes there. And this is very interesting because if you think about it, if you are a particular tourist, and Maybas is a very touristic city in certain moments of the year, uh, you can actually follow some scenery reviews, but also you know where to eat, which increase the local, <coughs> the interaction with the local commerce. And of course, it is interesting for revitalizing the economy. These kind of solutions, these kind of like small activities are very important. So in conclusion, I believe that one of the challenges that Maya Basi has done well and is something to learn from is that it's important to define a clear vision, where do you want to be, but also be flexible on the roadmap. Because as we can see, if public funding, for example, fades, we may need to remove some uh, activities, but also if we have new interests or for example, there's a pandemic going on, you may need to switch some of the priorities within the system. The local authority needs to be always the owner but, and the facilitator so the different uh, partners, public and private, can come together. And the platform needs to enable cross subsidization which is very important if you, want to, if you want to have a system working for many years and is important particularly for the mobility sector, but also for others such as healthcare. It is important to also upgrade their existing resources when possible. We often think about making a new map, New, new technology, but sometimes we already have the technology, we already have some, a support we can use, and it's easier to use that and easier to reach out the, the potential users than just make something new. And it's important in my belief to understand that digital solutions are urban transformation tools and not the other way around. So if we find what kind of physical layer one we want to define, then we can actually go into what kind of digital solutions do we need. And of course, and I think this is something to praise my base, it's important a positive branding and be inclusive into the communication. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that's all. And I hope if you have any questions, I'm happy to feel free to reach out. And I, of course, happy to uh, be on the chat. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Azarel, for, for your super comprehensive and super detailed presentation. Actually, this is, uh, I think, something that uh, the, the audience will recognize, and I hope the questions are going to come in the next next minutes. And uh, now I would just like to refer to some of the questions uh, raised in, uh, in the chat. 
uh, of course, uh, many of our experts have already responded. Uh, but I think this question from Frank, I know, Frank, can you can you join yourself or should I actually interpret your, because Frank is also our Secretary General also <laughs> today, so, uh, but uh, great to have you at, at least listening, if not capable of joining in. Hi, yeah, Frank. I can join in, I can join in, but great. I, great. My, so my, background, my background is a little bit weird uh, because <laughs> I'm still on vacation. Uh, with the family, uh, um, but uh, great, great presentations, a uh, very important uh, topic, um, good questions uh, raised. Um, I think in, in, in the planning community, there is a bit of double feeling about smart cities because uh, we as a professional planning community, we feel sometimes a little bit um, used in a game of uh, corporate uh, um, uh, interest uh, in smart city, and and then we just uh, cater for uh, for those uh, those uh, profits, as usual. Um, but uh, indeed, it's better that we 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 reown that that concept and and re redefine it uh, within a, a broader concept of smart uh, society. So I I fully I fully uh, appreciate the, the contributions. And also the last presentation also reminded me how important it is to be always uh, vision driven, um, shared vision, you know, vision uh, really involving all uh, layers of uh, society, which is, in my view, the most uh, difficult thing to achieve as, as a planner. So I also would like to throw the question to uh, the speakers, how can uh, technology and this smart uh, technology be used to enhance uh, uh, civic involvement, public participation beyond uh, tokenism. So beyond uh, just consultation, but really um, co-creating uh, a vision instead of uh, uh, consulting the public on a vision developed by smart experts. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Frank. So. Is there somebody who wants to, to follow up on this question? I think Professor Nagumo already touched upon this uh, in his presentation, and I like it a lot because it was about not material, but also immaterial values which are happening, which are rising there among the society. So I like your notion of emotions, of, of feelings, of romance, of uh, anonymity, need for anonymity. So those are extremely important indicators which are not mentioning uh, that, that much in uh, uh, our daily life or in our professional life. So it is somehow sidelined and neglected. So all these hidden factors, but they're still there and they contribute to the very same effect as all these material factors. So um, I, I like it a lot. And I think you, you touched upon in your presentation upon this. So if you want to elaborate more, please. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. So, you know, the current measurement system is pretty much economic, right? So GDP per capita, GDP, whatever. And uh, uh, people are now talking about ESG or SDGs beyond financials. Non-financial measurement system is definitely in needs, particularly from the societal perspective and uh, environmental perspectives. And uh, in essence, the all what we need to measure in the at the national level can be cascaded down to a city level as well, because cities are where people live, play, work, and do whatever. So if you can do, do that in at the city level, probably you cannot do that at the national level. <laughs> and uh, another story is that the reason why I started this exercise, the creation of the measurement system, was that you know after coming back home from the work, I talked to my wife about, about smart city project I was so excited about. But she says, so what does it mean to me? Does it make my life happier? So there's a gap between you know people's daily life and the technology. So I, you know, as a husband, have to do something, right? So I decided to come up with the idea of the, you know, measurement system beyond financials. 
Sure, and also a um, follow-up question on this. So uh, it's very impressed actually how you developed this uh, livable um, well-being state indicator. So my question, uh, was there some uh, previous research on this so which you actually um, follow up on? So I suppose I saw some references to uh, UN Habitat and UN and UN Habitat indicators. And uh, uh, how did you tailor this to the case of Japan? So what was the most critical issue to tailor to? Because you mentioned some specificities in the way how self-perception is realized in Japan, how relationships to others are, are done there. So can you can you also elucidate on this a bit more? Right. As a previous research, uh, there are lots actually in the domain of the livability indicators and the well-being concepts. Uh, I actually adapted idea from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, they were already exercising livability indicators using open data sets at the national I mean, municipality level. The second was the uh, Nordic countries, which are already famous for well-being implementation. And wherever you go in, let's say, uh, Finland, you never, uh, you, you, you always hear well-being somewhere in the documents. So they are all, all you know, tied up to, uh, connected to the concept of well-being. So I decided to bring those two into one package. And the uh, challenges I faced in Japan is that one, um, Collecting subjective indicator is very difficult. Right? In essence, you have to do the survey to get the voice of citizens uh, in a subjective sense. So we decided to run a huge program and I, we actually just finished collecting the data and then we're cleansing data right now uh, for analysis. And uh, of course it co it's costly. And then you really uh, have to open the data to everyone. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. If it's you know dominated by someone for business, it doesn't really cascade down to municipalities. So getting subjective data and make it open to public is the first challenge. Second is the equality or equity amongst the um, uh, municipalities. Once they get enough data, other don't, then it doesn't really work. So how can you find out data that is all available to all cities? So we came up with uh, about 200 key indicators with the collaboration of the national government. All the ministries get together and you know, search for the data needs. Do we have that data? Do we have the data? You know, longevity data, health data, you should have it. And then you know, check it out for the you know, um, delivery of the data through one system. If it's separate system, it doesn't work. You have to put it into one bucket. So that's another challenge. Exactly. Thanks a lot. Um, Konyri, Yurada, uh, are there some concerns on your side or also we are very well? Welcome to all other questions from the audience. Uh, I hope the answers in the chat were uh, satisfying to, to our audience there and maybe also a question by by Frank the first one to Mr Mr Naguma yeah um is society uh five zero in Japan government or business led and what is the role of civil society so you actually elaborated on this in in the chat but uh, can you just highlight the the basics uh, okay this, this is my <laughs> uh, yeah yes 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 it's okay <laughs> okay so it is the activity itself is uh, government led right? So government develops as a kind of the a direction of the society, not a goal. It's a, just a direction. So what, what we have to do is we have to develop a goal, of course, and realize that goal. So for that purpose, the Nagumo-san's activity is very important for us. So not the a technology introducing is not a goal. Goal is a kind of the well-being. Goal is a livable city. So that's I mean, so we put that Nagumo-san's activity and society got 5.0 is combined, set a goal, and the how we realize that goal is not only just the government. To realize that industry is important and also citizen is very, very important. So we need a, a citizen role very much. So as I written down is, okay, so for us, we need a kind of the a well-being of the diverse citizens, not just one guy, not just two guys. We have the very diverse citizens. 
and they have the different well-being. As Nagmosa mentioned, each city has the different goals. So that means we have to so think about how real that is not only just by government, uh, not only just by the local manipulations. It, it's, we need a very diverse variety of the services. So we have the very different people. So not only for this, okay, like, uh, okay, just adult, not just Japanese. So we have the very much people. So to realize that we need diverse players, diverse players will be a, okay, realized by the citizen. So citizens, a participation is very much key for the realization of the a uh, 35.0 it is my understanding sure sure of course and uh coming to this and uh one particular um, practical example so Azarel, can you elucidate a bit more what participation tools and mechanisms were used in the, in that case of my bashi project so we just saw this great uh, last slide where were some drawings on the way uh, towards uh, along along the line along this river but what were the specific participatory tools and methods used so how actually what what can we learn from this how to adapt and and combine integrate this smart city and smart society approach yes um i say in the chat actually nagumo-san was involved into mayabashi much more than i was so for the early stages he can probably give a better glimpse uh, because i'm a latecomer but um, coming once the, the thing was set up, and one, one thing, one important thing is that I mentioned the, the fight between Mayabashi and Takasaki, and that's actually more, it's probably one of the most important points in the presentation, if that's what it looks like. The reason is that whatever we're in Europe or in Japan or in Asia, it doesn't matter. It all comes about what is the political vision, what is the, the goal. And this actually tends to be overlooked but it really depends we can see in Europe for example I'm currently in Spain and I saw a city that changed its whole mobility landscape because there was a new government that was more uh, um, green wise but another city that was where the conservative won they just scrapped down more uh, sustainable mobility solutions so this is important and coming back to Mayabashi um, one of the things that Mayabashi was the city where the previous, the former president of entity that I was actually born. So he was very much into, I want to do these things in my city. And that kind of facilitates things. Now, one important thing is that when we think about Japan, Japan is very uh, different from other countries in the West in how the business and the partnerships are actually done. And we need to understand that every single city in the world has different uh, ways to, to do, right? So what have worked for Mayabashi in terms of outreach or uh, achieving consensus or achieving uh, working direction may not work for a city in, uh, I don't know, in Finland, for example. So that's, that's one important thing. So understanding the local culture is very important. That's one. And for Mayabashi, I think it was very important that everyone was in, invited, as I said before, all the all the bus companies, all the taxi companies, when it comes to mobility, were invited. Um, the difference here would be, for example, what kind of IT companies were invited. So, and this is where the Japanese uh, mindset and the working group mindset comes in, which is hard to extrapolate. Some practice in Japan will be actually consider uh, will hard to consider, for example, in Europe. And uh, so, it's very important to understand this kind of local culture. I believe. Exactly. I fully agree with this. Yeah, this is something which is a, a golden thread, red thread of all our research and practice in, in planning. So to be aware of different cultures, different planning cultures, if you want to be more precise. Yeah, so in the coming of um, second comments or questions, I would like to ask you to turn on your cameras because <laughs> our dear Marite wants to make some snapshots, some brief photo for our documentation and, and for the promotion on the website and social media. So it would be great to see you all there now <laughs> present. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, and uh, Yurara, do you want to um, wrap it up somehow or Connery, something on your side? So we are close to, yeah, we also uh, ran a bit of time. Sure. Um, I'll just uh, some thanks. So I want to thank all of the speakers. I think that we were able to really grasp like the uh, abstract aspects of smart city and sort of the idea of what's happening 
also on the ground. And I'm very also happy that we were able to have our speakers share insight about what's happening here in Japan. And I hope this, this event will uh, result, result in future discussions in the relations across our borders and professions. And I think that the urban peace planning field could use a little bit more of uh, international discourse, I think, especially in our country. So um, that we can learn from each other and possibly cooperate beyond the limitations of our cities and the uh, national borders. And there are definitely, uh, I think someone mentioned, uh, definitely fundamental issues that I think are related to the nature or conundrums of real estate development or planning or maybe even just economy as a whole that we still need to address. But um, I think it's also important that uh, to discuss smart city policies in parallel is sort of one of the new tools of conventional planning policies. and. Uh, thanks again. This event was sort of proposed and planned very spontaneously and organically, if you will. So it's very exciting and we appreciate all the speakers once again for making time in their busy schedule. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, with this, I think we can we can close the session. So as mentioned, um, uh, the entire recording will be on our Isocarp YouTube channel. Uh, thanks a lot for our speakers, of course, presenters. Thanks a lot for audience and great questions and chat post. And uh, yes, as I mentioned at the beginning, so this is going just to be the continuation. Let's consider this as a starting phase of the further continuation, be this in academic and professional domain uh, and spreading our, our actually influence in Japan and also learning and taking lessons actually from Japanese society and bring it back to other contexts to extent it is possible, of course. So we, we all agree on this. So thanks a lot once again. Have a nice evening, have a nice day, and see you soon some other time. All the best on our side. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, Anna. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all Bye. the speakers. Bye, <clears throat> so I will stop the recording. It's going to be automatically on the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Super. Thank you.